better this time. So you do just see my um, uh, module page. Is that yes. what you'll see? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Feel free to pipe in and say yes or no or something because it's it's hard since you know everybody's muted out of courtesy. You know, but you can also talk if you have questions. So can y'all still still see me? Okay, yes. 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 Okay. So what I wanted to do. First, I wanted to welcome you. And the Zoom has a feature that allows for polling. So during class, sometimes I'm going to stop and ask y'all a question. And we'll use that as a way for me to see who all is here, make sure I can reach out to somebody that's not making it, and also to get your opinions on things. OK, so have y'all done that in your other classes? Anybody? Yes, I have. All right, so what I want to start out with is taking a look at the module page. And so last time we, uh, day one, and this is what we did last time, I've completed uh, writing back to you about these assignments. Thank you so much for, for um, providing information. It helps me know you a lot better and helps me more confident getting to know you for the class. Okay, so the only changes from last week on the research paper, because a few people weren't able to log on, um, what I did is I created a getting oriented assignment. Also, I sent an email to you about this as well, right? So if you read this, this tells you what good these files are and just gives you like an overview. It would be the same thing if I were in class and I would be showing you this page in the old days like it was on tracks. I would go, here's the tracks assignment. Here's the things you need to look at. So I just put that in writing here so you've got that orientation. The other piece is I went through and talked about the project again, just like we did and created a video. So this video's got a YouTube link and if you wanna go and see the um, uh, uh, research presentation, if you just want a refresher, if you and your partner want a work, a refresher for working on it, then that's, that's of use, I hope. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing. Come on, this screen, come on, there you go. Um, new share, okay, I gotta get it open first. Now my dream is that you only get to see the presentation and it actually looks good. So I'm gonna ask you this question here. So how does it look? Can y'all see the presentation? You have to talk because I don't see you anymore. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, I can we can see it. You might wanna go check your email again too, to see if everybody can get logged on. Okay, this will just take a second y'all because I can, um, yeah, one second. Nobody, okay, thanks. Everybody got it then? See it again? Yes. Yeah, okay. Thank, thank you for saying so. That's very helpful for me. I appreciate it. Okay. So, um, and we're recording this meeting. So I'll post this after class. I'll cut out some of this um, yammering that I do at the beginning. Um, so this is the uh, breastfeeding, uh, the first lecture on breastfeeding. And um, now that I say that, I'm going to escape out of here again. And, uh, and do a new share. And because I wanted to also show you uh, the breastfeeding section here under course topics. So I wrote you yesterday and I believe you all got it where you have access to the, the presentation we're looking at today. So for this breastfeeding module, um, I, again, on every time we talk about something new, I'm gonna get you oriented. So this page includes policy statements and resources, some videos. These are videos that I typically show in class that help illustrate uh, things about infant feeding, especially breastfeeding. And I may not show them during class because I fear that the resolution of the videos will be so bad by going from my screen through, you know, to, from YouTube to my screen to you, my screen to you. So I'm going to recommend that you look at these on your own. And I'll try to give you some time to do that maybe in class a little earlier sometime. So you can do it because these are critical pieces in understanding what I'm talking about. They're very nice. They're short videos and they're very educational. And so here's the policies. Um, we'll talk in the breastfeeding lecture about you know, the physics of breast, or physiology of breastfeeding, the nutrition of breastfeeding, and then also policies like who recommends, what are people recommending about breastfeeding. So, and then here's the videos and then 
Um, I include some articles to back up what I talk about. So you will see these are topics in the uh, lecture that in particular are uh, emphasized. And so you can come here, like for example, did infants get enough B12 from breast milk? It's right spot on one of the topics that I talk about. And then at the bottom here, I have the lectures and study guides. And you know this because you got my email yesterday. And as I build on this module, I will add the, the recording of the lecture and then also additional uh, lecture. So now I'm going to go back to, anybody got a question before I go back to the PowerPoint? You good? I, I have a quick question. Sure. The study guide, is that um, embedded into the PowerPoint or is that a separate no. document? Uh, I, what I say there, and I didn't say it out loud yet, you'll get a study guide, but the study guide um, will be posted at the end of when the lectures are completed. Because what I do is, you know, nutrition, you guys know how hard nutrition is, right? You're always learning so much. So with nutrition, um, with this class, I do a lot of work behind the scenes, looking at the current literature, see if anything's changed, see if we know anything else about that topic. And so I always change and update my lectures. So I update the first lecture, um, and then update the second one, and then put up a study guide that covers that. Now, what I can try to do is put a study guide for the first section, and then a study guide for the second section, so that you can keep up with that. Does that work okay? We're also, you know, there was a miscellaneous part of the uh, class in terms of the grade, in terms of quizzes. So we're going to also offer some quizzes. These will be worth their open book quizzes um, done on probably a weekly basis just to help you look at your lecture again and kind of get started on that. Okay, so that should be a, a help, hopefully help with, with, um, with learning and getting things down. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and present. Okay, so um, let's see. Oh, one thing I wanted to recommend is take notes. Now, uh, these, I try in every lecture to have uh, numbers at the bottom of the slide, so you've got your slide number, so that you can know where you are. And you may be taking notes on your PowerPoint, which is fine. Everybody's got a different style. And if that works for you, that's fine. Sometimes people don't, and or they may not have had a printer for it, or the print's too small, or something like that. In which case, you can keep a set of notes and just put it by slides. So in other words, put right down, if you said something of content here, you would write down the slide number. Um, so it's not on the first slide, but on the rest of them. So I, I, please take notes, because I'm gonna talk about, I'll emphasize some things that aren't, the words aren't exactly on your slide here. And so that'll help you, I'll, I'll remind you to, to start writing that stuff down. Okay, so brand new infant. This infant is probably less than an hour old. And uh, some of them, when they're born without a medicated birth and without a difficult birth, Oftentimes they're ready to go in a very short period of time. There's a uh, video called, or there's a, there's a video that I have uh, that's called the breast crawl. And what it shows is that infants at the moment of birth, once their uh, umbilical cord is cut, they can put the baby on the mom and the, and the abdomen of the mother, she's lying on her back, and the baby will actually on its own crawl up and attach to the nipple. So it's a pretty interesting thing to, to learn about. But before I get started, I think, um, I'm going to ask you one of these polling questions. No, I, I know I'm already starting, but let me ask you a question here. Um, do I have to type it or can I just ask you? I think I'm you pretty sure you could type. Never mind. Okay, oh. I'm, scared. I'm scared now. I'm afraid I'm going to bomb this. Okay, can you still see the PowerPoint? Yes. Yeah. Okay, let's just pretend like I didn't do that. Um, I'm, I need to practice that. Okay, so what I was going to ask you is um, if you, if anybody wants to share, and I can only see the screen now, so it'd be easy for you guys to talk. Um, do you uh, have any preconceived ideas about breastfeeding or any particular questions before we start talking about anything? And usually I start the class out this way because breastfeeding is interesting, right? Not everybody's familiar with it. Not everybody's, it's not a norm. For some families, it is a norm. Does anybody at the outset have questions about breastfeeding. I need at least five questions to, to, uh, to keep going. I have a question. Okay. Um, so I was talking with like some of my friends and whatever, and um, they were saying that, you know how obviously when you're pregnant, you're not supposed to like drink, right? You know, like beverages and stuff, right? Um, and I was debating with them and they were saying that you're not supposed to drink alcohol even after you give birth because if you're going to breastfeed it goes through the milk is that true or i have no clue no, whatsoever. I, I think this is a really interesting question and 
And I, you know, you can't say no risk because alcohol is a toxin and you know, everything you do is a risk, you know, walking around the room with the baby is a risk, right? But, but um, there, it seems to be like there's some latitude to where people can drink in moderation um, as long as you wouldn't want to do it early on and, until lactation is established. But the deal is, is the content in breast milk is the same as the content in her blood. So it's diluted a whole lot. It's not like drinking a cocktail. It's like getting very, very tiny amounts. And it also goes away pretty fast. So we'll talk about that later, uh, I think, in the, the next slide presentation. That's a good question. Anybody um, else? Question? Yeah. Um, is there any correlation between um, breastfeeding a child and like their intelligence between yeah. not breastfeeding a child and their intelligence? Okay, here's one thing you're gonna find out is that there's a lot of really strong literature on breastfeeding. There's so many positives about it, but very few things are cut and dried. Now, a cut and dried answer to that is if an infant is premature, um, because during the last like third trimester, the infant puts down a lot of uh, um, omega-3 fatty acids in the brain. So brain development's real important. And also the infant's just not cooked well enough. The gastrointestinal tract isn't mature. And so, and the brain itself uh, isn't um, finished growing. Well, it doesn't finish growing after birth either, but, but the, the uh, unique combination of breast milk for premature infants, there's hands down a difference in IQ uh, from kids that are fed uh, only artificial food if they're premature versus full-term infants. There's also some literature that some infants, and there may be some genetic differences, may respond to breastfeeding by increasing uh, cognitive uh, capacity uh, or functionality. So there's, there's some of that, but it, it's hard to say unequivocally, you know, that it's well, it's seven IQ points because there's so many variables. Here's an example. Um, people that uh, breastfeed their kids are generally more educated. So how do you compare kids that are breastfed to kids that aren't breastfed when the families are different? And so they have different resources and, and that makes a big difference, right? And so there's, there's so many variables that it's hard to pin it down, but on, on the, the, in general, I would say that it probably helps. I don't know to what extent. Okay, third question. These are fun, right? It's interesting. I've got a question. Yeah. Well, what about um, what about its effect on gut health and maybe allergies? Okay, that's a great question. Gut health, we'll talk about because it's in breast milk. There's uh, growth factors that help with with uh, and, and and human oligosaccharides, which I'm going to get to today. Um, so uh, that was one piece. What was your oh allergies? Allergies? Um, no. There se it seems to not to matter what mom consumes. We'll have a section on allergies later, but it seems not to affect um, uh, the baby's wrist, which is very interesting. Okay, one more question. I have. I have. Oh, go ahead. Me too. Go. <laughs> oh, so I was going to ask. I was watching one of the videos, and it was talking about the regulations with promoting um, formula milk. How does that compare to the United States, like from a dietetic standpoint? Like how do we like counsel mothers like to make that decision? Um, that's the billion dollar question. There's been so much, um, so many health initiatives, uh, position statements, health initiatives, World Health Organization, um, and all the, all the American organizations to Canada, everybody has their own organization. They do everything they can to promote breastfeeding. Um, so how do you get it to happen? I, I think that's kind of what you're getting at. Well, one thing is the formula industry. There's several things. I could talk about formula for a full hour, but I won't. But I'll talk about it some when we get to formula. But, but uh, the formula industry, it's a money-making industry, like everything. And uh, they have a, serve a very important function. Some babies can't be breastfed. Mom can't do it. And so then we have a very a healthy alternative. So that's great. Um, how do we help women be able to breastfeed there's two ways of looking at breastfeeding. It's, it's a duration, no, it's initiation and duration. I would write that down, you guys. Initiation means starting breastfeeding and duration means how long. So for example, right now in the United States, about 80% of babies in, are initiated with breast, breastfeeding but then it falls way down after that. So in other words, it doesn't work. And it doesn't work for a variety of reasons, which where I was going with this is uh, maternal support. 
You know, in the United States, we have, we really don't have anything that passes for a reasonable leave. Some, I've known some women that have had to go back to work after two weeks. There's no way you can establish breastfeeding. I mean, there's a way, some people do it, but it's very hard because you're still recovering yourself. So women need more support. Families need more support for this. It's not just a woman's thing. The entire family is involved with how the baby's fed. So last question. Uh, yes, I had a, a question concerning um, if the, the mother has any kind of um, immuno, like if they're immunocompromised or have any kind of diseases, would that affect your ability to be able to breastfeed your child? Okay, that's a great question. It depends on the cause of the in, immunocompetence. Um, uh, are uh, compromised. Uh, for example, HIV positive is something that we talk about, and this is real interesting. And uh, this will get us into formula later too, but, but in developing countries where the water is not safe, um, the formula industry markets heavily to new mothers. They often get the kids started on formula because they think the kids will be healthier. They get dysentery and they become very sick with that. Okay, um, so I'm getting back. A little, um, what, what did you say right before that? Oh, it was, um, it, it's the immunocompromisation. Oh, okay. specific diseases. Yeah. yeah, I was giving background on that. Okay, so thank you, I got off track. I mean, I didn't, I was giving background, but um, if the cause is, is someone is HIV positive, in the United States, you actually don't wear breastfeed because we have a clean water supply, formula is the way to go. A birth can certainly happen from an HIV positive mom with the infant not being HIV positive, so you sure don't want to, transmit it, but in developing countries where the water's bad, um, by that I mean filled with bacteria, um, then, then um, it, it is more dangerous actually for kids to formula feed than it is for them to be exclusively breastfed. It's very interesting. So they're safer exclusively breastfeeding than having any formula in terms of surviving and also they, many of them make it through without becoming HIV positive. It's interesting. Okay, thank you. So I'm glad you guys have some questions. This is such a fun topic. So um, here's a slide. I like to start out with these slides um, that have to do with normalizing breastfeeding. And so, uh, you know, I've stolen one off the internet. Another one I took in a store, okay? And so you see a little girl, especially on the right, how cute that is, right? She's just thinking about it. This is just how babies get fed. Um, when we grew up, all the dolls had, you know, came with bottles that pretend like they were getting, drinking or whatever. But, but so when kids are around breastfeeding, it's normal for them. Um, and so they just don't think about it so much. So here's another one. But when, when bottle feeding is the norm, sometimes it's difficult for people to make that transition from, uh, from being comfortable with norm of, of bottle feeding to, the com to, to being the comfortable with the norm of breastfeeding. Normalizing it's one of the things we can do as dietitians. Um, I have those bottles in there um, to show you that there are bottles now that are made that work pretty well for delivering pumped milk. And so it used to be harder to get infants to go from exclusively breastfeeding to maybe taking a bottle some and she can express her milk and take a bottle some, but there's really nice bottles now. And so, um, so that, that's beneficial. Okay, this is something I won't ask you a test question on. This is just for fun to get you thinking about it. Like I'm not gonna ask you to trace the history of, of breastfeeding in the United States, but I just think it helps to get your head around it. So, you know, a long time ago, mother breastfeeding was accepted. It was sacred and magical, which I would still consider that to be true today. Um, wet nursing, for the, which is another woman breastfeeding the baby if mom can't, was a common alternative. I imagine family members that were lactating would pass the kid around. And so there's a lot of that was going on. And sometimes an infant had to be artificially fed, um, but you know they would use uh, milk from other animals. Unfortunately, without doctoring those up, um, the, those straight milk is lethal, okay? Because the renal solute load is different. You know, the, the, the composition of the milk is made for an ant, like a cow is made for an animal that gets up and starts walking around real soon and, and infants need a totally different uh, type of food. So, but, but then people started messing with it, starting out with milk and then coming up with alternatives, right? So we'll, that'll be the evolution of it. So then, then it became, wet nursing became, uh, you know, physicians didn't like it anymore. And so, so they just wanted women to breastfeed their kids, but then, um, um, but you know, there was still the rich people oftentimes had somebody uh, be a wet nurse for their infants so they could, you know, not be tied down so much. The problem with that is without birth control, the people would have just a lot of babies because exclusive breastfeeding decreases 
um, it decreases fertility for a period of time. In fact, it can do it. It can be pretty effective if a baby is fed every three hours or four hours um, over a period of time. Mom's probably not going to ovulate, which means that she won't conceive again. So she, it helps her space her kids. But in these cases, people just kept having a kid like once a year because if they weren't actually breastfeeding themselves. So you see at the bottom the kind of uh, vessels that were used for artificial feeding. And you, when you look at those, what, what do you think about them? Like if if um, if you had a new infant, how would you how would that work? Anybody? It it's it's hard. It's not it's not soft and yeah. Anybody else? It's not like controlled, like the release of the milk. Yeah. Yeah, so nursing on a, a, a nipple is real different than, than having something passive, and we'll talk about it. So one thing I'd like you to think about is uh, cleanliness. This is well before germ theory and before we understood what was going on. So it was real common for infants that were fed artificially to die. They got sick. Um, so later on, I'm not going to read all this to you, but you know, wet nurses were distrusted. This is interesting because they were using opiates to quiet infants, which is just interesting all around. And then we started doing a little better job of artificial feedings, bread, water, milk, broth, you know, enough combination to try to, try to get kids, uh, keep them alive. But again, without sterilization, we didn't know what we were doing. So later on in the 19th century, this is when we actually started, you know, um, uh, boiling things and keep in trying to be more hygienic and keeping things more sterile. So uh, the, the evaporated milk was, milk was developed then. Now you can't use evaporated milk by itself or, or diluted. It's, it's also lethal. It has to be used as part of a formula. But, so we were getting better at things. Okay, so then you can see in the late 1800s there were lots of different infant formulas. So here we go. So now the 20th century Nobody does wet nursing, and we're, we're all, of course, fearful of all kinds of contaminants now uh, with the pandemic going on. Uh, so artificial formula became very popular, and so physicians would tell moms, don't, don't breastfeed for a variety of reasons, sometimes just because it didn't preserve their figure to the extent that they wanted to and things like that. Um, and, the, you know, quite frankly, the formulas were pretty bad then. I'll give you some examples when I get to the lecture on infant formula, but so breastfeeding decline became very unpopular until about the 1970s, and then it started rising again. You can see some commercials down here, you know, just like now. This is the good part about a uh, free enterprise is people can make money. And the bad part is without regulation, we don't always preserve the health of people, right? So, so the industry serves a use, but, you know, they, they haven't always told the truth. So getting into the science now, okay. So this is, let's see, um, this slide talks about lactogenesis. Lactogenesis is the process of developing the ability to secrete milk. So developing the ability to secrete milk and it involves the maturation of breast tissue. Lactogenesis is being able to make milk. So after birth, lactogenesis is turned on. So, um, and we talk about it in three stages. The first stage, this is right after birth, um, mom will begin to initiate production in the breast. Now it's not really milk yet, it's colostrum, which I'll show you, but the, the whole lactation process begins, even without suckling. And then milk begins to form. And so lactogenesis can be the first few days. Sometimes people get nervous here because they don't see milk come out. They don't see milk in their baby's mouth and they're afraid the baby doesn't get enough. And this is one of the reasons that we, uh, lactation consultants often will weigh a baby before and after. But the first few days, they're not going to gain any weight because colostrum would just be in really small amounts. I'll show you that what I'm talking about in the next couple slides. So then, um, Lactogenesis two is when milk actually appears. There's the breasts have increased blood flow to the mammary gland. I'm gonna show you a gland on the next slide. This is when the, when the milk comes in. So mom's breasts will feel warm, um, different. They'll start to feel larger. I'll show you a picture of that too. They don't stay that way permanently, but her body's trying to figure out how many infants am I feeding? And so it can, it revs up pretty well at this time. Um, 
the comfort for this is that the baby, when your baby will re be removed from the breast, and it'll have milk on its mouth. You can so you can see uh, some. But now that there's so many nice pumps out that people can use uh, pumps, and then they can see if they're getting milk. And and so um, it used to be a little bit harder to, to do that, but the pumps are, are provided that are really nice. Then at about 10 days, the composition is stable. So then, you know, and your book talks about how milk changes over the few months. It does change, but not appreciably. You know, it just changes a little bit, but it's basically, is a little more stable in the first two stages. Now look at the diagram on the right. I wanna talk about a couple of hormones. They're also listed at the bottom of the slide here. So the, um, um, the, the prolactin is one of the hormone, hormones and this stimulates milk production. So prolactin, um, what happens is prolactin begins to be produced during gestation and then it stops. So it kind of helps get things started and then it stops until birth and then levels of prolactin go up. And so prolactin stimulates uh, 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 synthesis of milk. Now, the interesting thing about this is prolactin is also kind of an anti-romantic hormone. So when mom's breastfeeding you know, a brand new infant, she's less interested in how she got pregnant in the first place, I guess is a, is a way to say that. Um, and so then the other hormone that, that is involved in breastfeeding is oxytocin. And this is the hormone that actually stimulates milk ejection. So when mom puts to the baby to the breast, the baby starts to suckle Nothing seems to be happening and it takes a few minutes, a minute or two, depending on mom and how long she's been breastfeeding the baby. And then milk will start coming out. So the baby's got to suckle first. Okay, so, so that, that, and then and that causes milk ejection. Some people will be very forceful and then the babies will even choke on it because milk starts coming out. So sometimes they need to like back off a minute and help them out. Um, so both hormones act on reproductive orga, organs. Prolactin is what inhibits ov ovulation. And uh, as we mentioned, oxytocin, uh, it causes the milk ejection and it also promotes uterine contractions. So here's a maybe not well-known fun fact. When a woman has a baby, you know, there's all this thing about you know, the pain and the labor and everything. And so let's say you've gone through all that and you're sewn up if you need it and you're done with that. And you put the baby to the breast. When the baby starts suckling, oxytocin levels go up and that causes the uterus to contract. And that's painful again. So, so it's like, oh man, I'm done with all this. And then I hurt again. But that's very good for mom because sometimes women die from hemorrhaging after birth. And so the contraction of the uterus is good because it helps close off blood vessels and not, not allow that to happen. Okay, one other hormone I wanted to talk about is FIL or feedback inhibitor of lactation. This is a hormone that is in human milk. So let's say mom has two ounces of milk in her breast, I'm just making that up. There's a certain ma uh, uh, amount of hormone in that milk. The more milk she has in there, the more of uh, that FIL she has in there. So that, that actually inhibits her from making more milk. In other words, she's got her breasts are full. She doesn't just keep cranking it out. This hormone says, oh, don't make any more for a while. So then when the baby nurses, it removes the milk at the same time removing this hormone because the hormone goes out with the milk. So what happens there is then with the removal of milk from the breasts, then the breasts are going to regenerate the milk. So this is an important concept. And the concept is that what drives milk production is removal from the breast. In order to make more milk, she needs to nurse more and sometimes pump depending on the individual situation. Okay, so what's determined how much she makes again has to do with the removal of milk from the breast. I have a, a question. Yeah. So how does, how would breast enhancement play a role in this? Like if you had like implants, would it, does it work in tandem with this or does that cause complications or is that kind of a case by case basis? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. And, and it, at first, you know, people are going to have breast surgery both ways. They're going to have augmentation and they're going to have reduction, right? And so um, a, a couple decades ago, people didn't even think about breastfeeding when they did that surgery. And so they would often 
completely reconstruct their breast. So I even detach the nipple, remove things around, add, and, you know, add an implant or, or remove tissue depending on what they're doing, they reposition the nipple and so forth. So it was very uh, disruptive for breastfeeding. So the ability to breastfeed after that, you, you, you miss the, the connections, right? So you miss the, 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 the cells that make milk, which I'll show you about in a minute, that those cells make it, but it wouldn't be able to go out the nipple, okay? So, but now people are more sensitive about this. So the surgeries are more careful. So in breast reduction, they may be less successful, um, but with augmentation, if they can do it in such wherever they put in a silicone baggie or whatever, whatever they use now, saline baggies, if you put that in there without disrupting the, the, the mechanism of lactation, then they may be able to, to breastfeed. Good question. Okay, so this will help you a little bit with your visualizing. I have two slides about this. This shows you the, the structure of the, the um, lactating breast, okay? So as you can see, to, more to the point here, we have these uh, lobules in here. These are called, uh, th these lobules here are alveoli. This is one alveolus, and the alveoli are the uh, uh, functional milk production units group in the lobules. So there's a bunch of alve alveoli here. Okay, and so this is sort of a cross-section of the breast. You can see the yellow tissue is, yeah. can y'all see my cursor move? Yes. Okay, cool. All right, so the yellow is fat tissue, and um, you know, that varies by individual, right? And then this is the milk producing tissue. And so if surgery happens and this connection is, is cut, then you can see where breastfeeding can happen. But sometimes uh, when people have nipple rings or something, they can still breastfeed because they just have a couple more holes. So that doesn't, doesn't seem to be disruptive. So I know you all have physiology and these types of cells that line um, the uh, alveolus, these are called cuboidal cells. And these are the cells, and I know you remember this from physiology, these are the cells that se cause secretions. Okay, so the milk is produced here, and then the, the, the fluid is secreted into the space here, and then it goes into the space out to the nipple. And it won't go, I mean, it typically doesn't go until oxytocin causes a contraction of muscles that helps expel the milk. One more thing, about oxytocin. Um, oxytocin is also called the love hormone, and uh, I call it the puppy retrieval hormone. You know, when a, a dog has uh, puppies and it, it won't leave them, it goes and gets them and drags them around and puts them somewhere else, and it's madly in love with its puppies. It takes care of them. It changes its whole behavior. A mean dog can become loving, and so um, uh, the oxytocin does the same thing in people. It, it promotes attachment. Uh, to the infant. And, you know, it happens in, in romantic couples as well. So it's not just a hormone just for attachment to infants, but it's, it's a hormone that, that promotes that attachment. So this is one way that breastfeeding may be helpful for mom. Mom is less likely to uh, experience de postpartum depression if she breastfeeds. Now it's not cut and dried, but it seems to be helpful. So part of it may be the oxytocin. This is just, I like pictures a lot, and I've, several of you said that it helps you to learn from visuals as well. So this is um, just a blow up of the exact same thing that I showed you, but I just think this is so much nicer. This isn't the one for me, but you can see the cuboidal cells here. So you can imagine these cells here producing the fluid that, that then moves on and goes out here. Now, the, um, I mentioned uh, that breasts get really big at first, and they, they when, when the milk starts being removed, you know, there's, it takes, um, Supply and demand for you know a few weeks sometimes. Sometimes women don't really get comfortable breastfeeding until six weeks, and then they're so good at it. They're so glad they did it because it's so much easier than bottles and all that kind of stuff. But there's a learning curve, and it's not easy for everyone. And we'll talk about this in the next lecture. This one is more about the lactation process and nutrition, and then we'll talk more about the process in the next lecture. So anyway, the breasts get really big and. You know, I would recommend to women don't run out and buy a giant bra compared to where you were because it doesn't last. Um, but it can be very uncomfortable and feel even feel warm. And, and uh, warm is okay. Uh, infection is not okay. But I'll talk about the difference in that. But this is a normal thing to happen, and it'll go down. In fact, by the time a baby's three months old, the breasts seem just like they were um, before pregnancy. They seem the same size. Um, but there's still a, this a adequate milk production going on. It just doesn't feel so, such like such a big deal, I guess. Okay, this is a slide that I won't ask you details about. I want you to understand the visualization, of, so I might ask you something very generic about it. But this is one of these cuboidal cells. Okay, so here's the blood. 
This is a cross section. Here's one of these cells that are producing secretions, and this would be the duct where all the milk goes. So you guys have had physiology and cell biology, and you remember this stuff, how we make proteins, right? So via the Golgi, Golgi apparatus. So proteins can be synthesized and put into the milk by exocytosis. Lactose is the same thing. And then fats are also made in, in, in the cell, and then they go out as globules. And I'm going to tell you something interesting about that in a minute. So this is how a fat gets in there. And it's not just, it's not just loose fat, right? Okay, this, these are formed in the form of globules. And then a lot of molecules can just move right across. And then there's super important components. Um, IgA stands for, and I'm going to spell this or say it really slowly, IgA is an antibody and it stands for, uh, uh, yeah, immunoglobulin, I-M-M-U-N-O-G-L-O-B-U-L-I-N. I'm used to writing on the board. Immunoglobulin A. There, there are other immunoglobulins in your body that do different things. There's IgG, IgM, IgE, which is the allergy one. This is the one in secretions. And so mom, this is the, one of the coolest things ever. If mom is exposed to an infection, right, and she has developed an immune response to that infection, then her milk contains antibodies to that pathogen. So what this does is this protects a nursing infant from environmental exposure to, to pathogens. And it's not perfect, but it is helpful and it can stop uh, kids from getting getting illnesses. I know of a uh, long time ago when my kid was at a, a, my children were at a, a friend's house who was loosey goosey about vaccinations. Uh, one of the kids there, um, a five year old kid, hadn't been vaccinated and no one checked. She got whooping cough, and the woman's whose house was there was uh, had a three week old infant. She was exclusively breastfeeding. The infant did not get whooping cough, but what a scary thing. Um, my kids had vaccinations, um, and so they didn't get sick, but it just goes to show how breast milk has this extra added effect of being protective. And then some other components can get through here. So it's hard for me not to look at you guys because I can't see your faces right now, but I hope it helps to at least have an image of how breastfeeding works. And I, I forgot to tell you that after a few more slides, I'm going to give us a break and we're going to talk for a minute. So you know, bathroom break or something like that too. So. Uh, I don't want, I'm not going to drone on the entire time, but okay, but I am going to drone on for a while. Okay, so this is a slide, and, and I love this one, um, uh, that compares the composition of formula to the composition of human milk. So as you can see, they all have water, protein, carbohydrate, fat, vitamins, and minerals, and formula has been manufactured to copy as much as possible these things. You know, that the that some of the proteins are different because they come from soy or cow milk and you know the vitamins may be in different forms but nonetheless the, the nutritional list of nutrients is there. Then you look at human milk and you see all of these other components and I'll talk about these um, as we go through the breastfeeding lecture but the purpose of this slide is just for you to see a visual and so you might just want to mark it and you know uh, notice that human milk is a lot more complicated than formula. It's a biological fluid that's produced specifically to nurture young, and it's, uh, it's kind of amazing. So we'll talk about some of these things here. There's the word immunoglobulin for you if, if I butchered it too much and I spelled it out loud. Okay, colostrum. Colostrum, as I mentioned earlier, I told you I would get here. Okay, colostrum is produced during lactogenesis one. Remember the first few days after birth? And it's a very thin fluid, it looks more like this. And sometimes mom can only express, like she, you can express milk and you push on the breast and sort of massage. I usually talk about this, like here, here's the breast and then here's the massage, right? So I can't do these visuals for you and on, online as easily, but, but she can massage the breast and then and push a little bit um, towards the end and so you can see the fluid come out. So she can see colostrums there. Um, even if she finds that, she can take it and rub it on the inside of the baby's mouth because you want them to have as much of this as possible. And look how little the volume is. A newborn is getting almost no volume. Now, when they're in utero, they're also drinking very small amounts of fluid. They're drinking amniotic fluid during the last few uh, weeks of gestation. And in fact, they drink and pee into the amniotic fluid. Okay, so that there is that. But so the um, colostrum, 
um, can be in a very small amount per feeding. So you may think, oh, well, nothing really happened here, but it does, because this is like a medication tailored to the, the needs of the infant. So it's lower in fat and carbohydrate, high in protein. It's got a lot of immune components. Okay, so it, it helps that it has that IgA. It's got something I'm gonna explain about a little bit later, lactoferrin. Let me tell you what lactoferrin is here and then, and then again um, more formally. So you might wanna take a note on this. Lactoferrin is an iron binding protein in milk. What it does is it binds iron, keeping it away from bacteria. So bacteria are less likely to grow um, or to, to uh, uh, it, it actually protects the milk itself as if it's sitting out a little bit. Bacteria are less likely to grow because they need iron and there's not really bioavailable iron form in, in, in uh, um, colostrum or in milk. Okay, so, so lactoferrin binds iron. It's a whey protein and I'll talk about it again shortly. But so colostrum's, you know, no, this doesn't sound very scientific, but it's, it's, it's sort of a magical fluid that's, fluid that's tailored to getting infants started. Then um, this is just showing you, I'm gonna talk about full milk and high milk in a minute. This, this, this is when, this is mature milk um, that it depends on if it's early on in the feeding or late on in the feeding. They're just showing you a color difference. So this milk has actually, you can, it looks like milk, right? And this doesn't really yet. Okay, for perspective, and I'm sorry, I wouldn't actually personally use the word tummy in a scientific class, but I did find this, it's a nice visual, so please forgive me, um, but to make people comfortable with how much a newborn needs to consume, you can see that the, the volume of the stomach's pretty small for a long period of time. Okay, this slide, I will not ask you a question from it because it's a bunch of numbers, but I do want you to know the concept. And the concept is colostrum is different than the milk produced during the, up until 10 days and the mature milk is even different. So colostrum starts out, as, you in, as we indicated, with more protein. And mature milk has a lot of lipid. Okay, human milk, this is close to 50% calories from fat. And you can also see that there's not much protein in human milk. We'll talk about this and compare it to cow milk and formula in a little bit. So the concept I want you to get here is that milk changes and then it becomes mature and stays fairly stable. Okay, so the next few slides are about um, components in milk. Okay, so we're, we're focusing in on term milk here. We're gonna talk about some components uh, that are of, of import. First is water. Now this is, this is my visual. It's a water bottle with a line through it. Um, water is not needed. This is a big deal. If an infant is exclusively breastfed and getting enough milk, then the likelihood of being dehydrated is very low. Milk is isotonic with maternal plasma and, and the infant doesn't need water. Like you don't want to give water to a breastfeeding infant because it'll, it'll fill up that little small stomach instead of allowing the nutrient rich milk to do that. So don't want to give uh, water, and they used to give glucose water. I remember when my, I had my kids in a, one of the first birthing units uh, 30 and 34 years ago, and uh, it was a birthing unit in Austin. And even there, I had to be careful because they wanted to take the baby out and give it water and glucose. So I knew better, um, but you know most people didn't because they didn't. They weren't weeks like like that. But so now they don't. They're, they're less likely to do it. And we'll talk about this. A lot of hospitals are very good about promoting breastfeeding now. Okay, so this is also the statement of the American Academy of Pediatrics, just breast milk. Okay, this is very, very interesting. Um, when we talked earlier about the benefits of breastfeeding and, you know, is breastfeeding, does it make kids smarter, for example? And I said, you know, it depends on what we're talking about. Some in some cases, breastfeeding is, is really significant, and in some, it's not so different from formula-fed kids. But childhood obesity, the prevention of childhood obesity is one attribute of breastfeeding that shows up in the literature over and over again, and I believe it's 
supported by enough that we can say, safely say that it is protected. So that's a big deal considering our obesity crisis. Later on the semester, we'll talk about child obesity. So we'll get back to this. So let's look at the reasons why uh, breastfed infants aren't, uh, um, uh, are, are less likely to become uh, overweight. So first of all, they consume fewer calories. And this A through D here, A, B, C, D, these are um, how that happens. Okay, first, if someone is feeding an infant um, a, a bottle, okay, let's say a bottle of formula, it's real common for, it's human nature for us to try to get them to finish the bottle. Um, and people that are trained know better, but it's real, you know, people, people will shake it, wake them back up, here, drink some more. And you can't get a breastfed infant to consume too much because they'll stop. They have to suckle in order to get food. But caregivers can try to empty the bottles, so training helps them with that. Um, also, formula has more protein in it than human milk. And put a star around this because this is a thing that we're going to talk about all semester. High protein diets may stimulate overweight in kids. I actually have done some research on that. So keep that as a thought and we'll get to it. But if higher protein can lead to higher serum insulin levels, and then the insulin is what stimulates storage, lipogenesis and storage, for example. Okay, another reason is the feeding experiments. Is it a question? Yeah, could you repeat what you meant about the high protein diets? They can stimulate Yes, thank you. Thank you for stopping me. Please, always, you guys, don't let, don't let this be any more awkward than it has to be. Um, so, yeah, so uh, human milk has a certain amount of protein, not very much. Formula has typically more. Um, and sometimes, too, if people don't mix it up just right, maybe they put the scoop a little full, something like that, then there's even more protein per volume. And formula, uh, uh, because of the higher protein, that's gonna cause the infants consuming that, that protein stimulates insulin levels to rise. And insulin, besides facilitating glucose uptake, also stimulates fat synthesis. So it may be that higher protein diets in uh, young infants and also for certain in children are one of the culprits for childhood obesity. And I think it's so interesting because we have all these you know, keto diets, paleo, uh, paleolithic diet, um, you know, low, high protein diets for adults. And it's an entirely different ball game than, than it is for kids. They, they do not need to eat high protein diets. Okay, so the other thing is the feeding experience is different. And I'm going to, uh, one of the videos I have for you, I really want you to take a look at. I'll, I'll talk about it in a minute, but the bottle, oftentimes the nipples are bigger and the baby may sit up or may lay down and just the whole experience is different and may cause them to consume more. Also, among the many components in human milk, there's leptin. And leptin is a hormone that causes satiety. So a breastfeeding infant may get full faster. Now, it doesn't mean they don't get fat when they're little because breastfed babies blow up like a balloon and then they'll slim up. So there is that. They grow, seem to grow faster, but they don't have the same risk for childhood obesity. Okay, and the second point there should be a number two. I just noticed this after I uploaded it. That should be a two obesity protection um, at the bottom. Um, that may be related to the microbiome because a formula-fed infant and a breastfed infant consume entirely different diets. One is highly processed and one is natural, and it, they cause the growth of different uh, bacteria in the, in the gastrointestinal tract. And there's been some studies that indicate the kind of bacteria you have affect body weight. So, so this is interesting. Breastfeeding may be, may be protective. It seems to be pretty good, uh, pretty uh, clear that it's protective against um, overweight. Now, this doesn't mean that breastfed kids are good for life because if they start eating the American diet when they're one or two, they're gonna run the same risk, but this can be helpful. Okay, this is what I was talking about. This is an infant, and I have a video for you to watch on this. This is an infant that is being paste, paste fed. And what that means is instead of him lying on his back with a bottle, you know, tippled, right? Um, and then, then the infant's held up. And you can see what the, what the caregiver will do, we'll put a little bit of uh, milk in there and, and, the, and the end of the nipple and then make the baby work for it. 
So this is what the baby would be, it's a smaller hole in the nipple, and this is what a baby would be doing if it was breastfeeding, is it would have to work to get the milk out. Uh, an actively nursing baby, sometimes they're so cute, they'll get little beads of sweat all over their head because they're working so hard to get the milk out. So it also affects their jaw structure and things like that too. But if they're fed this way, instead of passively on their back, they're less likely to consume too much. This is, and, and this is helpful too for uh, breastfed infants that are in daycare. If mom is capable of pumping and providing enough milk to send, then they can pace feed the baby during the day and it'll last. But if they feed the baby with the normal way that you feed, a, you're used to feeding a bottle fed baby on their back, they'll knock back a lot more milk than they would normally. So they'll end up running out of milk during the day, even though that's not how much they consume normally. So it's pretty interesting. So a uh, child adult specialist, yeah, go. So um, how would this be augmented if you had a child that couldn't feed orally? Like if it was just tube feeding, are there specific signals that you'd have to look for the baby to give to know that they're full or how would that work? You know, that is such a good question. And that is a, we go under the, the umbrella of um, uh, clinical dietetics, all right? And so there's a whole fields of pediatrics, um, the pediatric dietetics, where you'll be working for special, you know, special situations like that. And kids with Down syndrome have different problems, right? The kids that, like you said, they, they can't consume yet. So it's all different. This is, this is basically a lecture on well babies feeding, okay? It doesn't get into the clinical issues. Um, but do we have a graduate course that does do that? So stick around and get your master's. Okay, um, let's see here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about, yeah, I'm gonna keep going. Are y'all alive, y'all okay? Yes. You okay, you need a five minute break? You good? You good, okay, let's keep going. I'll stop five minutes early just, just out of kindness. All right, so this slide is on carbohydrates. Lactose, which you're familiar with, you've learned about lactose forever, it's a primary carbohydrate. Um, but what I want to talk about is this category, because I imagine this is a type of carbohydrate you may never have heard of before, and it is um, the hottest topic in uh, the breastfeeding literature and the science of lactation. It is just so interesting. So let me tell you what human milk oligosaccharides are. I bet you can already tell me. Y'all know what an oligosaccharide is, right? Yes. Tell me. Anybody, we're not putting anybody on the spot here. Remember what a monosaccharide is? Yes, monosaccharide is just a one, one glucose molecule. Perfect. Disaccharide? This is two. Both, okay. Oligosaccharide, oligo means few. So an oligosaccharide is Single, car, single sugar units stuck together, only a few of them. So a few, not just one or two, but maybe four or five or so. So the, the, the HMO, I know you've seen HMO for other reasons, but they're called human milk oligosaccharides. Another term is glycans, and i like you to know all of these things. And also, these are not, and I don't have this written down, so you need to write it down. These are not digestible by um, the infant. So in a way, it's almost like fiber, right? Because if we consume carbohydrates that we don't break down, that's what we call fiber. So these are, these are not there to nourish the infant, but they have a big effect on protecting the infant. Now let's read a little bit here. So mothers produce hundreds of unique HMOs. So one breastfeeding mother may have 100 different kinds in her milk, just little small carbohydrate units. Infant formula, there, there's work on this, but they have not been able to mimic this because these are biological compounds um, that are just hard to do. And there, there's been a, oh look, did I do that? Yeah. Wow, that is so weird. Okay, excuse me for the yellow lines here. Okay, so mothers, I'm gonna figure that out. Um, so, so they can't make it in infant formula. There's one or two that have been marketed in infant formula that aren't the same as the ones that mom makes, but they may be beneficial. But let me tell you why they matter. Okay, so there's a list here. One is, and I'm gonna show, uh, illustrate it one on a couple slides. So one is they act as prebiotics. 
And I know you remember this, but I wrote it down to make it easy for you, but um, they stimulate the growth of beneficial bacteria. So remember I mentioned earlier that formula-fed and breastfed infants get different bacteria. This is why. Okay, another, this is one reason. Another is they prevent pathogen attachment to the, the infant gut. I'll show you on the next slide, but they prevent pathogens such as bacteria that would normally cause diarrhea and dysentery. They prevent them from attaching to the gut. I'll show you, it's really interesting. They may, may also help uh, make the intestinal epithelium more mature, enhance their immune response to the baby, maybe even affect brain development, and also prevent a serious condition called necrotizing enocolitis, which I'll show you on this slide in a minute. So these are, this is a serious list of bona fides for HMOs. And this is, for me, this is the most standout difference between human milk and uh, infant formula. We can, we can make formula to match a lot of the things, but we can't do this yet. So here's the slides to show you what I'm talking about. Um, this slide, let me get you oriented here. Do y'all see some yellow lines? Do y'all see a yellow line here? Yeah. 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 And I think uh, there's, uh, I believe, uh, Ms. Laura in the chat. She was trying to take notes and thinking that it was only going to show up on her screen, but it ended up showing up on everyone's screen. So that's what those, those lines may be. Okay. <laughs> that's interesting. I'm like, what happened? All right. Let's keep going. Thank you for the information. Okay. So here's picture this as a gut cell of an infant. Okay. And this is if the infant's formula fed, so it doesn't have any of those HMOs. So here's how it gets sick. A back, pathogenic bacteria like salmonella or something, the way they enter into cells is they bind to cell surface receptors. So they, these co-evolved and this is how they take over the machinery and cause the cells to break down and make the baby sick as they, they attach via these receptors. So this is, normal without breast milk. With breast milk, um, the oligosaccharide can do a couple of things, but one thing it does is it, the, here's a picture of one, these are sugar units, like glucose, uh, sialic acid, something else, something else, galactose, right? Non-digestible. Um, this looks to the bacteria just like this receptor. They're very, part of the cell receptor, they're very similar. So it works as a decoy. So the pathogens, instead of going in and getting into the cells of the infants. Instead, um, the, the bacteria bind these and they're just, uh, they, they are uh, digested and pooped out basically. So this is a way to uh, protect the infant from getting uh, dysentery and diarrhea. And in developing countries where the water's not clean, that's what kills them. If they get into several stages of malnutrition because they get diarrhea from bacterial contamination. So human milk is a major, major benefit for this. Okay, here's another way, and I'm not gonna go into more details about that, but uh, the oligosaccharides can actually change the, the development of cell receptors so they don't look like this. So there's lots of things that they can do. Okay, now this is not a pleasant slide. I mentioned a couple slides ago that HMOs may be protective against a condition called uh, necrotizing enterocolitis, or NEC. This is something that happens to premature infants, unfortunately, um, too often. Up to three, three to seven percent of premature infants develop this condition. And what it means, enterocolitis, gut is, is uh, the, the gut and colitis is inflammation. So gut for inflammation, and necrotizing means it's necrotic. So the tissue is breaking down. And so uh, premature infants, um, if they start getting this, then they're very likely to die. Up to 50% of them die. And so we have found that human milk is protective potentially due to these HMOs. So now when uh, infants are premature, they are uh, written, if they're in the hospital, which typically is what happens, right? They're written prescriptions. If mom, mom can provide breast milk, that's the best case scenario. But if she can't, um, then uh, that's where human milk bank milk goes. So people that lactate produce extra milk can sometimes donate, if, if they've been screened and make sure they're, they're safe and not sick or anything, they can donate, to milk, donate it to milk banks. There's one in Austin. And the milk bank then sterilizes it and then 
uh, physicians can write a prescription for it. And so the infants get that human milk, that donated human milk, and that helps protect them from getting this condition in the first place. It also, mom's milk works too, but also milk bank milk works. So some magical things again, sorry to not sound like a scientist, but it's kind of, kind of interesting. Okay, so let's see where we are. I'm gonna talk about protein and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop off today because um, it's my understanding I sh shouldn't talk too long. Um, so I'm trying to work this out. I think what I want to do next time is have a break for about 10 minutes so we can have some Q&A sessions about what we're talking about and this would be a good way to do it. So let me, let me talk about protein and we'll stop when we get to lipids. This will give you time to go through and look at those videos too. Okay, so protein is only 10% of calories in breast milk and look at cow milk. Okay, so they're so different. Cow milk is not, not made for human infants. Human infants, the thing about it, we don't move for a long time. We just basically the first year you grow a brain, you know, cows get up and start moving around. So we just have different, different nutritional needs. There are two types of proteins found in the primary proteins found in, in uh, uh, human milk. You've heard of whey and casein before. I know you've all had food science. Uh, whey proteins, um, the most abundant is uh, lactalbumin and lactoferrin. Remember I mentioned this earlier. This is also one of the major proteins. This is that, that protein that binds iron and it helps with the immune function because it makes the iron more bioavailable for the infant, but not available for the microbes. So this is one of the immune components of, of human milk. And then casein is just there. It just helps make calcium soluble and parts white color um, to the milk. What's interesting though, and you don't, I won't ask you this, but um, because they fixed formula, but, but human milk is more like 80% whey and 20% casein, whereas cow milk is the opposite. Okay, so when you make, you, know, you, you if you made cheese in the, in the food science lab, right, you add, a, uh, you add uh, acid or bacteria, and so you get all this clotted protein just because there's lots of casein. Okay, so that, that's the difference. Okay, so this is where we're gonna leave off now. Um, uh, this, this, this ends the um, formal discussion of, uh, for now. I'm, I have more time on the syllabus to, to spend another day finishing this lecture. Before Wednesday, I'll have the next lecture posted too. I'll try to get your study guide posted for this so you can get started on that. Um, but let's, uh, are there any more questions? Now, I'm not interested in getting off. I just want to make sure that, uh, that we have time to, you know, to ask any more questions that will come up. So mm -hmm. is... Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> so with the, it, would you say that it'd be a, a bad suge suggestion to have the infant on both formula and breastfed? It's never bad. Any, any breast milk is beneficial. But I also, this is such a good question because, you know, I'm adamant about breastfeeding being important. I know I've read the literature for years and years and years. However, women don't get enough support and sometimes women have to go back to work and they feel the pressure, the weight of the world on their shoulders. You know, they not only they've just been through a pregnancy, sometimes difficult pregnancy, but then they've got this connection and they're trying to, trying to lactate uh, uh, at the same time that they've got, you know, they may not have enough care, they may be trying to go to work. Um, it, it's hard to do. So um, I, I feel, I guess, a great deal of compassion for, for women during this time. They need lots of support. We need better policies to support it. But in the meantime, we don't have them. So some women are lucky enough to have the resources and breastfeeding is just easier for some people too, right? It just, it's, it's easier for some people. Some people struggle a little more. So, um, so, so um, anyway, that, that's pretty much my answer. So they're going to, some people have to end up giving the formula. And when they do though, if they can continue with breast milk, the, the literature shows any breast milk is beneficial and more breast milk is more beneficial. So you don't want to introduce formula. I, in an ideal world, but we're not always in an ideal world. And in the United States, formula is safe, you know, and because we have a safe water supply, at least, at least here, not in Flint, Michigan, but that's another story. So any other questions? Yeah. Um, is there any like right or wrong age cutoff for breastfeeding? I know some moms prefer to keep, keep it going for a long time. 
Yeah, I love that question. That's usually one of the first day questions people ask because it comes up, right? So, so um, here's the thing. It's about the normalizing. So we're, we're in a society where it's gotten better, but there's still, it's still not as normalized and people are still embarrassed. You know, we, it's interesting because, you know, breasts are used to basically sell cars and all kinds of things. And you know, scantily clad women are used for, you know, breasts, breasts are very uh, popular in advertising. And yet, when you know, think of Victoria's Secret, okay, and so, uh, and, and then when we talk about having uh, infants um, uh, breastfed, all of a sudden, a lot of people are, are disconcerted by that. Like, well, I don't know, you know, our breasts aren't for that, right? They're for, they're for being cute. And what I have to say is they can fulfill all needs, okay? They don't, they don't just have to be one thing or another. Um, but it helps, the normalizing helps. The more you know about breastfeeding, the more you can share with people, and people don't get so weirded out about it. So back to the, your question. And um, there's been some research on what, what would happen if we were just natural organisms and we weren't in the societies we have, because our societies are very structured, right? They're so different. And, and, so, but if in, and so more indigent populations, or uh, places where the water supply is not clean. Um, the World Health Organization says up to two at least, and as long as they want to thereafter. Some, some babies are kid breastfed till they're a lot older than that, you know, even four years old. Um, in the United States, that's gonna raise eyebrows most of the time, but there's nothing wrong with it. It's not, it's not, I, 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 I really, it helps me talk to you guys in person about this. It's kind of hard to, to get it across this way, but there's nothing wrong with it. You know, it's just, we've kind of been conditioned to be modest and sometimes our society has been conditioned that, you know, breasts are something you should never let anybody see. But then we, we go out to restaurants and breastfeeding, breastfeeding women aren't supposed to breastfeed their baby. You know, the baby's the only one that needs to starve while they're out, right? So there's, there's ways to do this where people can, can still live, cover up or be comfortable or whatever they need to do and have, just have support. So there's not really an answer. Um, it's how, what the World Health Organization says um, is as long as the mother and infant are, are satisfied. And here's the thing, no one keeps breastfeeding into adulthood. It's not some kind of perversion, they stop. And if you go look at jails, all the people that are in prisons aren't from kids that were breastfed too long. <laughs> it's, not a, it's not some kind of thing that is inappropriate. It's just a societal difference. Does that make sense? But, okay, anybody else? These are my favorite questions. So I had a question, what would be some of the concerns or benefits of a mother who was breastfeeding and was vegan? And was what? Vegan oh, or vegan. vegetarian or on some sort of special diet. We'll talk about that the, the rest of this lecture, um, in this particular lecture before we start part two, the rest of this lecture talks about some nutrients that are hard to get. For example, vitamin B12. Right, so vitamin B12, she's liable to be deficient and she could actually, um, the infant can experience seizures if she doesn't take care of that. So there's certain things, vegan, you know, I'm, I'm a, let me give personal um, perspective here. I like to do this in class, you know, where I come from in terms of diet. Um, I've spent many years being a vegetarian. I guess when I was 18, I became a vegetarian and stayed that way. Um, but in my mid thirties, I started eating fish because I realized that we actually need omega-3 fatty acids. And I, I, I stopped eating meat because I don't like the way animals are factory farmed. I don't like how we handle that stuff. I think it's heinous. Um, but, and you know, I, I don't know if I can justify fish. At least they get to swim and live in their lives, you know, and not live, live locked up somewhere. But I don't know if I could justify that. But nutritionally, I can. Um, and so, so that's where my, my, want, my, my druthers are. What I think is the most healthful diet is pretty much as much plants as you can eat. Just, you guys know this, right? As many whole foods as possible, as few as processed foods as possible. Some processed foods are fine because we do live in, a, in an advanced society and we have time to eat everything from scratch. I mean, think about it, olive oil. Even if you eat a pretty healthy diet, you need an oil to cook your vegetables in, right? So it's processed, so, so anyway. Um, so next. So vegan can do it, but you need to take supplements. I don't think it's ideal though. I think a, the ideal diet is a vegetarian diet with small amount, if you want to eat meat, small amounts of meat or small amounts of fish, it's probably the best. Not the potato chip diet, or pop tart. I had a question. Yeah. Um, is, oh shoot, I just forgot my question. Okay, 
Okay, I remember. Um, animal milk, you said, was lethal, but I don't know if you explained why exactly. Okay, good. Okay, undiluted, like if, if an infant doesn't have breast milk, it's, it's a week old, no breast milk, no wet nurse, no mom, nothing. Um, then when people used to feed them straight cow's milk, the protein is so much higher and the solutes in there are so much higher that it damages their kidneys and they die. It's the wrong formula. Okay, that's the thing. So you can make, you can use cow milk to make a formula and you remove a lot of the protein and then you, you match the same components of human milk in there. So formula is balanced. Cow milk, straight cow milk is not and it causes kidney damage. Thanks for asking for clarification on that. I really appreciate it. I usually stop in class and draw on the board, so I guess this is my board drawing time. Anybody else? <laughs>